are we accelerating? Is everything around us moving and changing more and more rapidly? Are we looking around, trying to keep up? Are we at peace with this? Those questions, they come back to the idea of self, like how we see ourselves in this landscape that we've created. I think the art that you remember is often because it's disruptive. It's disrupted the normal. It's disrupted what you know. It's kind of broken that film that separates you from everything around you. I look for those moments where something's pushed me into a different place. It shocked me. It snapped me out of what I know. It's caught me off guard. And I think that disruption has a place in our society. I was fascinating doing an exhibition at the Geffen. Having seen that space for so long, I was so restless to do the vision that I had for the space. We started to work about two years ago, maybe a little bit more, to finalize the plan for the exhibition. And then the installation itself took about a full month of different crew installing different parts of the building. One of the things about collaborating with Philippe on the Mocha Show was I think he went very deep into these projects and really found connections that I wasn't even aware of. You know, when you do an exhibition, the first thing that you do is you spend time with the artist you took. You work with him to extract what is the core of the work, of the practice, of the aesthetic. And then you find in the body of work, in the career of the work, the most groundbreaking, powerful example of this aesthetic. We kind of developed this idea that we would just almost make a living film set. Could you approach this in a way that the second you walk through that door, you're no place and there's no sense of time? Everybody will encounter a different experience. You're not walking in and seeing the exact same thing. Sound is moving. Red Irish setters, red bars. Moving images red are starting and stopping at different times. Two hundred and forty dollar down, fifty dollar, fifty dollar, two fifty. Two hundred and fifty, thirty now, thirty now, thirty now, forty now, forty now, fifty now, fifty now, sixty and fifty. 
it's about letting the viewer get lost. We did a piece called Migration, a work where we went across North America. Every city or town we would film in, we would use a different hotel or motel. And in each of these places, we would introduce or reintroduce different wild creatures that were kind of of that region. Working on that piece was so fascinating because you see this idea of the modern condition. You see this kind of absolute repetition and sense of sameness. These hotel rooms are basically completely anonymous, yet they're cities apart. Within them, you see these creatures who were here before we were, have their own migratory patterns, and suddenly they're encountering what's really there now. We're kind of living in this historic and seminal moment right now. We've pushed past the Industrial Revolution, and we're kind of coming into this new territory. How do we navigate it? You know, I think these are questions that we almost find ourselves asking every day. There are a few ideas that are, for me, dominating these kind of 25 years of work. The idea of landscape is extremely interested in what is our contemporary landscape. Could be an urban landscape, could be the desert, could be the ocean, could be a psychological landscape or a digital landscape or a soundscape. But what is our surrounding and how do we inhabit this landscape? The installation Electric Earth was made in 1999. For myself, it was the first piece where I was able to really break apart the narrative. I didn't want a film. I didn't want something that you watch passively, but instead something that you navigate, that you move through. The work itself is a story of a man who kind of wakes up to the nocturnal world. It's as if he's the last person on Earth. And as he's moving through the city streets, the street lights, the phones, the ATM machine come to life. And within this work, I think it really explores the struggle that we all find of living in absolute synchronicity with the world around you, and then at other times being left in the dust. The second idea for me is interest in strategies and aesthetic of communication. If you live in a landscape, what brings people together is the way you communicate. The third very important idea for me in Doug's work is this notion of expanded cinema. I decided that we can explode the narrative and we can fracture a narrative in order for everybody as you work through this multi-screen immersive installation that ah, is expanded cinema, recreate your own narrative and be part of it instead of being passively in front of a screen that project at you. You saw me crying in the chapel The tears I shed were Where am I from? Different places. Where'd I grow up? I can't tell you exactly. Take a deep breath. And whenever you're ready. Check in, check out. My idea of experience is a series of fragments. Some stories are long, some stories are short. There are impressions and images and sounds and words. Caught in motion. And I think we live in this kind of brilliant electric collage. Everything has possibility and everything is part of experience. Detained for a day. When I see myself looking at art, I'm not really looking for the story so much as something that is the sum of all these fragments and how they can be assembled differently. Check in, check out. That idea of, of nonlinearity, I think, speaks to 
where we are now, where we're going. Check in, check out. Is part of a generation that by using the technology of today has changed the way we think of an exhibition. He is, for me, among the artists who are at the forefront of art and experimentation. He is reshaped our experience of art. I think every individual has aspects that make them so distinct and unique. They might be subtle or they might be pronounced. They might be certain questions that you find yourself asking again and again. Or they might be simply the way you see things in some quirky and beautiful way. Art making for each and every individual, it kind of comes out of that root system that they have, that quality that makes them unique. I've lived in this location for about 20 years. The original house, it was slowly eroding and decaying, but the location for me was really interesting. I had an idea to destroy it, and I had an idea to kind of choreograph the destruction of my house, and I wanted to bring my mother and father into it. So we built a table and we kind of cleaned everything out of the house. It was just white and minimal and this one table. I invited them to sit across from each other every day for seven days. Over the process of those seven days, we choreographed the destruction of the house around them. So that was kind of the first iteration of this place. That was the first kind of life cycle of it. I've been so focused on making this artwork and that involved, you know, the sense of time and entropy that I almost lost track of the fact that I was destroying my own house where I lived and slept. I had to build a house quickly so I wasn't sleeping on the studio floor. It took about a year and that's where we are now. This house was kind of designed more on a series of ideas than it was practicality. It's not about what furniture you get or things like that. It's like the space, if it's just your space and you live in it, it should have some kind of meaning. The trees outside, we had photographed the trees, the hedges. The hedges were then turned into silk screens. And the walls are hand silk screened. Sometimes the light strikes these hedges, creates the exact same brightness and chroma as the inside and outside, and it's as if there's nothing around you. I thought about perception, and I thought about the idea that could you design architecture on perception? Could you have other aspects like sound, for example, playing a role in the architecture? The house itself, underneath the foundation, are a series of geological microphones. As we walk up the stairs, each has a contact mic that can be tuned differently. You can play the stairs, or you can walk over to these tables. One's industrial marble, another's chambered wood. It's designed so that you can sit here and you can be with friends. If, for example, words fail and there's no use for language, suddenly you can make sound and rhythms can cross over. Have that dinner conversation that suddenly has that awkward standstill and everyone moves into sonic patterns. It's interesting that we're often restricted by words and language, but that's simply not the only way. I was interested in this idea of the architecture kind of coming to life more. An opportunity to try out these ideas and live with them. I don't really see that there's a separation between art and living. I see it's just one continuous thing and it's continuously moving. I'd always grown up on the ocean. 
When my mother was pregnant with me, my father disappeared into the ocean. They thought he drowned. He disappeared for eight hours in the winter time. Found his body washed up about a mile or so from the apartment they were living in. He was okay, he survived. So I think that idea of the ocean for me has always been present. It's always been kind of in the foreground. It's visceral and tactile, and it's going to live on its own and do what it does with or without you. What we see isn't really the ocean, it's the surface of the ocean. What's underneath that is so diverse and so mysterious. You find yourself looking at that and saying, how could you understand more about it and how do you start? While we were working on the exhibition Electric Earth at MoCA, I really wanted to create something that was outside of the museum, that was in the landscape. When you live in California, you're so aware of the ocean, and I found myself constantly looking at the idea of the ocean, thinking about, is this a possibility? I didn't want a situation where you drive there conveniently, pull up in your car, and visit this work. I felt that there should be a process, a journey involved in seeing this work. Catalina is interesting because on one hand, across the channel, 30 minutes away, you have this huge, sprawling modern metropolis, this grid of city lights and electricity. Yet, you take this ferry and you suddenly slow down. The boat ride allows you to kind of move at a different speed. You arrive here, you get off the dock, and you find yourself in this place which you know, has a kind of brilliant ecosystem. That proximity, the tension between dense urban sprawl and this small town of Avalon and everything that's happening in the environment here, it creates a kind of very unusual energy. I think in a sense, it allows a viewer to step out of their comfort zone and fall into a different speed and a different space. I had wanted to do this project under the ocean for some time. It was so seemingly difficult. It was very hard for us to find a starting point, who to talk to. Who do you get access to a section of the Pacific from? How do you build something that isn't crushed under the pressure and weight of different elevations in the sea? How does it withstand the tides and currents? Those were things that were daunting, but we were kind of chipping away at it. When we met Parlay for the Oceans, it really kind of empowered that process. All of a sudden, there was a community of people we could talk to and engage and have a kind of back and forth with, and that is when the project really came to life. Parlay, today it's an environmental organization that raises awareness for the beauty and also the fragility, the horror of the situation we're in right now, pretty much destroyed the sea. The idea of working with the Ocean Conservation Group that is really trying to raise a sense of awareness of the oceans, to really kind of focus on the conditions of the oceans in the 21st century, where we're at now and where we're going, was incredible. On one side, we provide the artist with everything that he needs to work in this new element, the oceans. Access to ocean biologists, access to submarine makers, access to all kind of legal support even to get the permits. It's very important for us to really jump in and take the responsibility. What I really love about Doug is that he's questioning not only art itself, but also the stages and the audience for which art is made.
this is the first week that we've put these works together. Three separate sculptural works that are made to be placed under the Pacific Ocean. The underwater pavilions. What would be the best way to experience them, well, I if I don't know how to swim? <laughs> I think the pavilions ask the viewer to kind of go inside, go under the surface of the ocean, go into a space which is unfamiliar, open up their perception in a certain way. You have these structures which are large, and they're geometric and balanced in shape and form, but that's really a decision because there needed to be a counterpoint in a landscape that is so organic and so in flux. These underwater pavilion, I think it's him bringing us to the water. The pavilions are each different in their architecture and design. Some of them which have an interior which is rough and aggregate-like, which is designed for sea creatures to cling to and nest and live on, to eventually be overrun to become almost ecosystems. Other sides of the work are mirrored and creates an entirely reflective kaleidoscopic surface. The idea here is to create something where all the landscape around it folds into the sculpture. We want to make something that was really living constantly changing throughout the day, throughout the night. There's three openings in each pavilion. These are designed to allow the viewer to swim through the work, for sea life to move through or colonize the spaces. What we see here is a small lens, so the sculpture becomes moving image. Each of the sculptures have live feeds. On the ocean floor, there are three more live cameras. The sculpture, this kind of piece of earth art, but it's also transmitting at the speed of light to anyone, any place. The idea that you could be a student in Tokyo, a marine biologist in London, someone who's following art anywhere, and tap into this is something that I felt very strongly about. Taking something which is in a very remote location, but also democratizing the access. There are a few pieces that, for me, create this feeling of togetherness, where the visitors, the audience, is at the center of the piece. I mean, the first one I would mention is Song One. Obviously, by the structure it has here in the galleries where you have to enter this kind of theater in a round and be at the center of it. And the theater in the round in Greek antiquity was the birthplace of democracy. That's where people voted, that's where people debated. This round shape for me is this moment of inclusiveness. What's very important and interesting to me about this piece is that it was produced for the Urshan Museum in Washington. The Gordon Bunchaft building, which is circular, the piece was projected on the wall outside of the museum, and it's on the mall in Washington. So that's also the place where, that's the ultimate American plaza, where democracy is celebrated on a regular basis. And he wanted to create a place that would attract people. All the stars out tonight. I don't know if it's cloudy or rain. I only have eyes for you. With this work, I wanted to take one single song, I Only Have Eyes For You, which was written in the 1920s, and is one of the most covered songs in history. You are here. And repeat it and repeat it always differently. To go from person to person. And so am I. To map the world that we live in, in a way. if it's cloudy.
perception? Or do we keep our eyes peeled? Or do we remain alert to the world around us? And the piece again behind me, song one, is using a song, I only have eyes for you which not for me by chance. I think it's also this idea that we need to be attentive to our world. The collaboration with Parlay for the Oceans on the underwater pavilions was so unique. Contemporary art and conservation. We got involved and this was an idea. The way to reality was very far down the road. Doug didn't have the ties into the ocean community, but he had a vision, a very clear vision, and we helped to make this dream a reality. I'm Ian Griffith, I'm with DOER Marine. We're the company assisting with the project management of the installation. Tour Marine was the group that we worked with on designing and engineering the underwater pavilions. Their background is in creating deep ocean submergibles. It's a different realm for us, moving into the art. It's surprising the number of people that are excited by it and actually turning and looking at the ocean because of this installation. Typically with our projects, people find them fascinating. But with this one, I gotta admit, we've had the most interest in the most conversations with people about what we're doing and how it affects the ocean. It did not start as an ocean project, it wasn't managed as an ocean-related project. And then working in Catalina is very remote logistically for what we would call a construction-style project. We were a little skeptical when we first stepped into it. <laughs> to say the least. But as it moved forward and as we started to really understand what it was and what the benefits of it were, we're just gonna go with it. I'm Charlie Camby. I've lived here about 35 years. We're at the mole in Avalon where the boats come in and then right over here we have the crane that we launch our small boats from, and now we're launching this underwater sculpture from the same crane. The people on the island, the workers on the island, they have been fantastic. They're embracing it. They love their ocean that they have here, and they are very excited by this. They realize that tourism is a portion of this island, and the more people they have interested in the oceans and their island, the better it is for them in the long run. So they're fully embracing it and doing everything they can to support us. It's incredible to see how art has inspired people to turn and look towards the ocean and understand what's there. We're going to launch the dome and then we're going to tow it over to the dive park. We're at the Casino Point Dive Park, located at the north end of Avalon. This park has been established since the early 60s, so divers have a place that they can dive and be safe. You can't dive anywhere else outside of here in the city limits without getting a special permit. Initially what I did was a lot of survey work determining where these pavilions could go in, dealing with the local political structure in terms of city council, getting their approval, which we did unanimously. And then helping to provide information for 
the California Coastal Commission so that they could determine that this would not have any negative impact on the marine environment. The pavilions or sculptures are going in roughly in this location here, right outside the old dive park, but inside the new boundaries. The depths out here get out to 100 feet along the boundary lines, and uh, you can get close to shore and be in two feet of water. It'll be an activity that divers will come over to see. People will come from different parts of the world or they'll read about it and go, hey man, let's go to Catalina and swim through that and see it. The island is always looking for new things and, you know, kind of adventurous things and this will be one of them. Diving out to see the pavilions was miraculous for me. At first, you know, you find yourself, you're in motion, you're weightless, you know, you're moving past kelp forests and sea life. And then there was this kind of moment where everything I saw became kind of gray blue. And it was this huge field of monochrome color. You see the details around you. You see the ocean floor. You see the way the light's moving. And it's really like kind of looking at something that's absolutely alive in every possible way. Then there was a moment that I could kind of make out through the monochrome this shape, this kind of hexagonal shape. There was something very familiar and foreign about it, and it kind of drew me towards it. I found myself swimming inward and inward and at this strange shape. As I got closer and my vision came into focus, I could see the ocean floor reflected on it. I could see the sun and the clouds reflected on it. I could see all of these things, all these moving patterns underneath this vast sprawling ocean kind of folding together into one piece and it was like some kind of amazing living origami. There's so much repetition and there's so much sameness. Do we want to be framed by that? No, we want to have things that open us up, that engage us in the present, that thrust us into living, the act of living. I wanted to create a very short, fleeting performance that connected the earth and the sky. In this work, we created a musical composition where a rhythm was played that spiraled around and around in circles. And every time it would circle, the patterns of the rhythm would change. At the same time as this, there was a skywriting plane flying above, created a spiral that went wider and wider and wider. And there was a kind of live connection between the pilot and the percussion that was happening on the Earth that created a kind of connecting point. I think Modern Soul for me was a very fleeting work. It was this kind of moment in time. And I think a project like that at its best is something that someone encounters and it's kind of a, a slice of time that's amplified and then it vanishes again.
So if you look at Doug's work in general, the idea of contemporary landscape is absolutely central. From the very beginning of the career, the idea of what constitutes a landscape is key to his work. When I look at the underwater pavilion, they are, of course, about landscape. And I think, with time, these three architectural units that are echo chambers for what's happening in the ocean will become part of the ocean. Barnacles, animals, fish get used to them, so they will be a landscape that reflects on the landscape. At the core of this tree pavilion, something again which is at the very center of Doug Edkin's work. Entropy, this phenomenon where as you produce something, you produce erosion on something else. And the erosion on this something else is going to deliver something else. The Sonic Pavilion was the first permanent installation that I'd made. The pavilion has a hole at the center of it. This hole goes 700 feet into the earth. At the bottom of this hole are a series of sensors. And these sensors pick up the sound of the earth as it's moving, as it's rotating, and as the plates are shifting. They amplify the sound into the building itself. I really wanted to make an artwork that explored that sense of continuous change. We live pedestrian lives. We go to work, we go places. We don't really think about what we're standing on. We think about what could happen in the future, maybe what has happened in the past, where we need to be. The value of art is to disrupt that, to wake one up, disrupt you and bring you into the present. The other piece that for me, I, mean, I was talking about this installation Diamond C, which for me is also the perfect piece to talk about man-made entropy. One evening I was looking at a map and I was tracing the outline of Africa. My finger was running down the map and I was kind of passing countries that I knew. And I found this area where there was really very little information. There was almost nothing. I think it says zone one and zone two. And that was it. So I started to become curious. I started looking deeper and deeper into it. And that's when I realized that this was this enormous and very remote diamond mine. You have this piece of land in the west of the African coast, which is permanently being eroded and created. And a new geography appears through the erosion produced by the mining for diamonds. In making Diamond C, I didn't want to make a documentary. I saw it more as a kind of psychological landscape. I wanted to start with saying whatever was in this secured area would become part of the narrative. It would really kind of author its own story in a way. Diamond C was the first work that I made that was really an installation with multiple screens and using sound to create something that was much more of an environment. In creating that work, I was very restless with the idea of cinema, and I wanted to find a way to push past the screen. I felt that there is another space for the viewer to occupy. I wanted the viewer to be empowered, to really experience the idea of the work, to navigate on their own through what it was, as opposed to simply viewing it in a passive way. These pieces are really looking at using art as a way to kind of explore living systems or living encounters. They're more allowing the artwork to step back and the viewer to occupy that space. 
whatever's happening at this moment in the Pacific is really as much the artwork as what we made and put out there. The installation Mirage was created in the hills above Coachella Valley. It was a location that was high in elevation, but it really kind of looked down to this panoramic view of the desert and the desert suburbias. I wanted to make a work that really appeared and disappeared. I wanted to make a work that was created out of the kind of architecture that you don't see, the architecture that you forget, the suburbia, the suburban landscape around us. When you view the underwater pavilion or mirage, the vision of yourself is inescapable. You're reflected. But you're also, through those reflections, you're brought into everything that's around you. You merge with the landscape that's around you. When you swim through the underwater pavilions, your image is compressed and multiplied by a school of Garibaldi that are swimming past you or a dense kelp forest that creates kind of abstractions that are circulating under the Pacific. This idea that we've been living for the last several decades in a world which is accelerating faster and faster, I think that's actually brought us to a place where we now really desire the tactile. When we see something that's visceral and physical or natural, we see it in a way which is very different than before. We see it in a way where it's almost new again. In a lot of ways, works like Mirage or the Underwater Pavilions are looking at amplifying that experience of the real. We are living in a moment in human history where we are facing on one side total destruction, diminishment of our species. We are facing extinction. But on the other side, it's the most beautiful moment of mankind where we have all the tools, all the knowledge, we are connected. I think the first part is really that people understand that we are truly capable of killing the sea. This big ocean with all its life is totally close to extinction and we are responsible for that. That's a thought that people are not easily accepting because it feels so impossible. But once you realize that the oceans are about to disappear, then there's this emotional understanding that yes, I have to do something. That's how it starts. These pavilions put the light and the focus underwater. They're deck doors in a way. It's an invitation to join the ocean movement. Creating art that can open doors when you least expect them, that can start dialogues, that can make collaborations possible. This is really when art making expands in a very fluid way into the world around us. Art in some ways is like oxygen. You breathe in everything that you see around you. When you breathe out, it has a distinctive quality. It's art, but it's also how we see life. I think it was very important for him to have this exhibition here. I think it came with a very specific amount of pressure because he is born and raised here and his peers are here, his family, his friends are here, but also because he has seen every single exhibition in this building. And the people he worships as an artist, 
he has met them or met their work under this roof. And at some point, I think it was for him a very kind of unsettling, moving experience to think, oh, now that's me. I don't really know what I do. I say that in a very, you know, humble sense. I, I don't really know what I do. I don't have a kind of overarching plan. Every day is a new day and every idea that you're working on comes to you fast and sharp and other times is something which is a very long process of evolution. These ideas, for me, they become necessities. They become fuel for survival. They become absolutes. The process of making something is like the process of living, but it's just a slightly more focused version. Artbound is made possible in part by the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors through the Los Angeles County Arts Commission, the City of Los Angeles Department of Cultural Affairs, the California Arts Council, and others.